the agenda is to cover two different scenarios. Um, the first one is the, the premise is just kind of like an approval workflow application. And under the the theme of like a office or um, kind of like a business approval workflow app. And we'll we'll take a look at that and kind of show you what that means. And then some of the different unique components that help move a workflow process along. And then uh, the second one is a, just calling it like a janitorial or facilities management app that uh, allows users to, um, the, the premise there is like a hotel or Airbnb. And so if every day you know you have to go to certain areas of the facility and check off that things have been cleaned or reordered or organized, um, this is a, a simple example of how you can get started with that, uh, supporting that type of scenario. Um, so with that, I think we should jump in and start looking at this workflow approval app. Do you guys have, uh, is there anything else we're thinking of? Uh, the only thing I'd, I'd say is we have got a couple questions, not in the community, but um, um, in other places asking just how, what are the various ways to connect to um, a data source or a Google Sheet? Mm. So it might be good just to mention some of the different ways, because it's not just like one way you can connect to a Google Sheet. There's a, a lot of different options there. Yeah. And just show some of those. Cool. Okay, yes, then that, that would be a great way to get started with this workflow approval app. Um, so I'm gonna switch over. I'm gonna be uh, jumping around in my tabs a decent amount. If anyone uh, if, if anyone's having trouble following, please let me know. I'll try to also make the screen um, as big as possible. But um, let's, all right, so, we're in, uh, this app is just called Approval Workflow. And what Chris was mentioning is, there are a lot of people that are just trying to get familiar with, you know, uh, how does AppSheet relate to the data you have? And that's something that's very uh, unique with AppSheet is when you're building applications, AppSheet is not hosting your data. You're not importing or uploading um, your data into AppSheet. What you're doing is just integrating with it. And so, in this example right here, we're in the data section of the AppSheet editor. And what this represents is that three tables have been connected to. So this app, this application is gonna run off of three different tables. Um, AppSheet is very flexible in how you connect. Uh, has a variety of different data sources that you can connect to. Um, first and foremost, the uh, uh, Google uh, G Suite environment is, is really the easiest um, and where most people get started uh, with a data source, so in Google Sheets. But these uh, tables could be uh, in Smartsheet, it could be in Salesforce, it could be a SQL database um, that, is, that is located uh, somewhere, it could be um, uh, an Excel spreadsheet that is hosted in the cloud somewhere, so like in OneDrive uh, or in uh, Box or Dropbox. Um, and so you can just think of uh, when, when you start thinking about planning your application, um, there's it actually like some of the some of the most uh, uh, sometimes when I start building an application, the majority of time I spend is just in thinking about is specking out the application and what uh, um, what I what features I want in it and how the data is going to be able to support that. So we'll show some examples of it, but uh, I guess uh, one example right now is in this workflow application, really what, what I set out to accomplish is to give people in an office environment the ability to submit requests. And if the request is significant enough, uh, well, so, and the request will go to their manager. If the request is significant enough, it will then also be escalated up one more level uh, to get two levels of approval for the request. That's really the premise. And you can take you can take that scenario and kind of expand it out to whatever unique scenario you might have. Um, but that's sort of what the problem is we're trying to solve here. And so in order to do that, you have to start thinking about, well, I'm gonna need a table full of people. And in that table, I'm gonna wanna know who everyone's manager is. Maybe just to make the application easier to use, I'm gonna want headshots for each person. I'm gonna need email addresses. And so um, the requests that they're gonna be making, I'm gonna want them to put in details. Um, and I'm gonna to wanna to be able to track 
when they requested it, who has approved it, when it was approved. And so these are all the sorts of details that like, well, I know these are the types of things I want in my application. And so I have to make sure that my the tables, uh, my data tables support those, uh, that type of functionality. Is that, uh, does that make sense? You guys have yeah, that sounds, that sounds great. It sounds like you're trying to really take the reins of automating a process that normally a person would be managing behind the scenes, right? Yeah, right. So a lot of these scenarios, they represent something that has previously been done just sort of like in a spreadsheet or in a to-do list or even or pen and paper, a pen and, paper yeah. and a clipboard. Um, and so in this case, these tables though that I've connected, I talked about, you can connect to a variety of different data sources. Um, for the simplicity of, of a demonstration, all these tables are located in a single Google Sheet. Um, so they don't have to be, uh, but this, uh, this is a table of all the people in the office. Um, we have a table of ongoing requests. And so this is as people are using the application we're created, they're going to be adding rows to this table with new requests. And then I also have another table of request types. And so when you submit a new request, you're going to pick what, what kind of request is this? And based on that request type, uh, we'll determine whether or not it requires an escalated approval. So you can see like a technology purchase or participation in an event, that's going to require, I'm going to use that to trigger a second level of approval in my app. Whereas vacation or office supplies, is that's okay just for my direct manager to approve. Um, so to recap here, there were those three different tables in the Google Sheet. And those are the three different tables that we've connected as data sources for this application. Once you've done that, um, the and, and sorry, just to reflect, specking out what you want your application to do and what you want in your application is that should be a relatively you should you should spend some time on that, kind of considering it, because it's going to make it easier then to move forward once you have your data connected and once you start building your app. And for those who are new to app development, um, when Peter states the term spec or requirements, he's talking about designing your app because with AppSheet, it's your data drives your interface uh, and your user experience in the end. Uh, we have a really great series of uh, help articles actually in support I think it's support.appsheet.com that talks about how to design your application using your data better. So just yeah. to expand on that term, since we have some some newbies to app building here. Yeah, thanks. So <clears throat> I've connected these tables. When you're getting started in the app sheet, what the editor will do is it is seen. Um, so so hundreds of thousands of applications have actually been built in app sheet. And the editor is intelligent to know, like it will start interpreting when it when a table of people it has been connected. What it tries to do is it tries to match what is the data type in this column, and so it will set automatically some data types. And, and the, the the data type is what's going to determine a lot of the functionality that's possible in your app. So an example of this would be when I connected a table of people, and I have a column called headshot. AppSheet may recognize that as an image. There's a chance that it doesn't though, and so you need to go in and just scan all these data column types and just confirm that it is the right type of data. If it weren't, if it weren't image, for example, if it came up as a URL, um, you're gonna have to change it to image, and, and once you do that, that's the only way that you're gonna be able to build, for example, galleries or have thumbnail previews of these users. Some other data types that if you're just getting started, you should be familiar with are um, locations for one thing. So if you have addresses or if you have uh, lat long coordinates, um, those, those are very good to be familiar with and they'll frequently be automatically recognized. But if not, you'll want to do that if you want to build any maps into your app. There are, uh, you know, like numbers and percentages. There are uh, phones or phone or email addresses. Um, if you have contact information like phone, email, or URLs, um, that will also influence how certain actions or buttons are automatically generated throughout your application. Uh, we'll get to that a little bit later. Um, signatures. So if you have a column 
for accepting signatures, then that will give you the ability in a form in your application to collect signatures. There are a variety more, but uh, we can follow up with um, the and the article. Uh, Jen actually just posted App Design 101. There's also an article all about data types and just getting familiar with this. And it's it's good to explore these data types because it's a lot of this is going to dictate what type of functionality you might be able to build into your app. So we've set our data types now, and a really important piece of setting these data types is building relationships between the tables. And what this means is, um, if I just think about these tables as a whole, I have a table full of people, and I have a table full of requests. And the only thing connecting these two tables is who it's requested by. And so a good way to think about this is uh, for these people, the unique way of identifying who each person is is by their email address. We're going to assume that everybody has a unique email. So would you say that's kind of like the key to how you identify <laughs> people? <laughs> yes, thank you for that, uh, for teeing that up, Jen. Um, right, so we talk about the keys, the key of a table. And that's the unique identifier. That's the ID. A key or an ID is, is comparable. In this case, it's an email. For the requests, you'll notice we actually have like a, a, a special row just for an ID to make each request unique. But the way to relate this, so I, if I say wanted to look at all the requests of Mary Johnson or my own requests, um, the only way to do that is to basically look at this table and, and filter out, okay, show me all of them that are made by uh, Peter. And what, how the way that you set that up in the application is you look at your request table, you say requested by, now that'll default to be an email address because that's what it'll find in the data, but you wanna change that to a column type called reference. When you've done that, you go into that column type and you say, what table is this column going to reference so who who is this requested by it's requested by someone in the people table and once you've done that then that opens up um, the ability to show related requests so we'll get into these views here next and how to set these views up but the the short way of thinking about this is here's the person here's me you can see uh, there's some details about me, including my email, my name, and my manager, and the, the image that's associated with me. But then as you scroll down, you can see all those related requests. And these related requests show up just because that reference has been established. So now in the people table, you have related uh, requests that turn up as lists. These are basically virtual lists. They don't actually live in your data. They live in your app. Very cool. All right, so let's, um, I, I dwell on this just because this is a really important step for uh, building powerful functionality in your app. And so if you're not familiar with it, there's a variety of resources. We'll make sure that everyone has it, but feel free to follow up in this. So what are those called then? The resources? Those columns that don't live in your actual data. Oh, oh yeah. yes, good question. So these columns, uh, right? So if we look back at the people table, there's no related list here that shows up in your data. And so those columns are what we call virtual columns. Um, so if re as relationships have been established, or for example, this virtual column appeared, this one has appeared automatically by AppSheet, and it's basically just combining your first name and last name so that throughout the application, you can have a full computed name. Um, those are all virtual columns. They live in your app definition. All right. Should we take a breath for a second? This is this is how the data has been set up for this workflow approval. The the um, the fun part of this app is in the behavior and workflows tab, which I think we can jump over to in a second. But so far, uh, we're okay. No questions in the community. No questions so right. far. Okay. Um, so I guess just a reminder for those of you that have joined, come in a little bit uh, later. Please uh, add any questions or comments into the office hours thread in the community. So if you go to community.appsheet.com, it's gonna actually be the top post now. 
Um, so anything that we're talking about, go ahead and jump in here and add um, uh, the and it, add any uh, questions here. So Monica, for example, asked a question: deeper integration with Google Sheet or Google Docs. Um, and I think this this goes along with the other um, question by Tom earlier: is of what are some of the things that we're going to see now that we've been acquired by Google? What are some of the um, new things that are going to be coming out uh, or or updates? You know, deeper integrations, things like that. Yeah. Um, we don't have like a set roadmap at the time. There's lots of things we hope for and, and that we're going to work for, like uh, hopefully seeing a better, you know, improved integration with Google Sheets um, and, and Google Docs, things like that is certainly something that like we'll we'll be looking into. Um, you know, improving our machine learning algorithms as well, so that when you um, you know create an app from a column. Uh, you know, actually gets better at detecting what kind of data is in that column and then turning that into views and making that easier for you. Things like that are all, you know, improve, Google has a lot of machine learning know-how. So, you know, tapping into that and tapping into the Google goodness to find ways of improving the product or things that we'll be looking into and um, hopefully right. adding to it. The sky really is the limit, but to kind of set expectations, we are still AppSheet and we will continue doing what we've been doing uh, for the immediate future. Yeah. So, and, and um, just thinking about the the view type. So, Chris mentioned, you know, as soon as these tables are connected, um, AppSheet will already start generating view types based on those tables, right? So, it's going to try to interpret what is that data that you've connected, how can I use it, and then it will also start uh, creating views for you that you could start customizing. Um, in this case, I have customized these a fair amount, and I've broken these down to two different views. So one is um, for review. So if I am the manager of someone and someone has submitted a request, then those requests will show up in for review. You can see it's in the menu here and that's what I'm seeing here on the right. This is the, the app emulator. So this is showing a live preview of the app as I'm building it. And then the second view here is my request. So if I go into the menu and see my request, these are the ones that I've actually submitted for my manager to approve. That's sort of how this app has been broken out. And the way to do this, so each of these are just a simple deck view. Um, there are a variety of different views, and we'll get into some of these with this next application uh, that gets a little bit more creative with their view types. Um, but creating these views is as simple as just selecting what is the table that you'd like to build from. We'll talk about what a slice is in a second. What is the table? What is the view type? So would you like it to be a calendar or a dashboard or a chart or a gallery of images or a map? In this case, a deck is sort of a combination of thumbnails and uh, text. And then uh, just specifying what are the details of what's in that view? What, how are those different fields exposed in this particular view type. And this, these settings will change depending upon which view type you selected. And just an additional note on the term view types for those that are new to AppSheet. So a view type is what your end user, so maybe it's the company you work for or whatnot, that's what they interact with and see on their end on your finished application. So you'll hear us mention view type a lot. It's one of the most popular topics that we see referenced on our community or we get questions or requests about. Um, so this view type bit is, is pretty key to, to how you display and work with your application and your data. Yeah, and that's a great, um, I think, segue to the point of, you know, when you're prototyping this application, what you're previewing here on the right is sort of how this app will be exposed in a mobile setting, but it's really easy to switch over and preview it, for example, in tablet form. Or if you open it up in a new browser tab, then you're previewing this live application just as a web app. Um, Right, and it's important to know too that AppSheet does more than just mobile applications, right? I mean, dashboard view type, for example, is a really great one to use on a desktop. Uh, we just happen to design with mobile in mind because it's trickier um, from a development standpoint, but you can use any of the, the three device types. Yeah, at the end, if we, have, if we have time, we can switch over and look at a dashboard view um, as like a third agenda item. But in this particular case, this app is being set up as a 
mobile first functionality. Um, and so let's, uh, these two views, right? They're, these are two different deck views. And what we determine here is we have uh, uh, requests that I'm supposed to review and approve or deny. And then we also have requests that I have submitted. And you'll notice that, uh, let's start with the ones that I have submitted. Um, in this case, we have uh, an action, what we call uh, a button down here, the plus sign button. This is an action that will bring me, in this case, to a form. And so the, one of the primary ways and one of the primary view types um, of applications is actually just a form. And this is how you enter data back to your original data source. So let's just look at how this works. You can see right now row 28 is empty. If we go into the app, I'm going to go ahead and pick a request type. I'll say um, event participation. And the details, what kind of event should I request Ooh, to go to? Let's, uh, let's say um, the Grace Hopper Conference, which is a, a great tech conference for women in tech. I hope I'm spelling this right. I'd like to go to the Grace Hopper Conference. And in this case, I am, uh, I'm in a, a demo environment. I am Mary. And when I hit save, oops. Okay, so I'm actually, uh, I'm gonna um, do this from a different user perspective. Okay, so what I've done right now is I've just opened up the app. Uh, logged in as a different user of the application. So now I'm actually Peter. So I'll go ahead and say, now when I hit save, you'll notice that in the upper right, there's a little sync icon. And you can click that if you wanna force it, otherwise it will just sync in the background. Um, and as it syncs in the background, what it's doing is it's sending that data directly back. It's passing it through AppSheet, through that your app definition and back to the original data source. In this case, again, it's Google Sheets, works the exact same for any other data source. So what we've done right here is we've submitted this request and now the workflow part, which we'll, let's, look, let's open it up and just get like high level of how the workflow is, is operating. This is the first step of the request. The second step, is to get it approved by my manager. And I think in this case too, it's gonna to require a second level of approval. So maybe uh, it would be good just to explain why you had to switch to Peter in order to make this request. Yeah, okay. And like, who are the different users in this scenario? And, and what does that look like? Yes. Yeah. yeah, so for this scenario, if, if actually if we look at the uh, how the data is set up, um, so if you can see this, <clears throat> In my list of people uh, that that uh, the data that's connected to this application, um, I'm logged in as Peter. Peter's manager is operations at Brickland Holding, which is our demo environment. So I wouldn't worry so much about the details here, but it's basically I'm just pretending to be I'm posing as other users for the sake of this workflow, um, so that then operations will get notified uh, of this new uh, request. <laughs> Um, and so I just opened up the operations email address we'll, and we'll look at how this workflow is set up, but this is sort of it in, in process. And so I just got an email address that there's a new request from Peter. Um, it's the event participation. I'd like to go to a conference. I'd like to 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 a conference. <laughs> and when I click on the link here, it's going to open up that approval and land um my manager directly into that request where i where they have options to approve or deny the request these are actions and so and if they open this up on this email up on a mobile device would it take them to app sheet yeah so if they open this up on their mobile device this in this case it actually they don't need to have app sheet installed they don't need to have the app installed it'll open them up in a browser view okay directly to this request um and so in this case, if I'm pretending to be Peter's manager and I go ahead and approve it, 
this action has just gone ahead and approved the request. It has logged who approved it and it logged the approval date as today. Now, I think in this case, in our data, we have event participation set up as uh, requiring escalated approval. And so, uh, what that means is if we actually go look at um, this, uh, well, <laughs> this is an entirely new window, an entirely new inbox. This represents someone. Uh, like an admin level so or this VP is the, level. This is the operations of Brooklyn Holdings boss. This is the third. Whose name is admin, apparently. The third <laughs> user, yes. Yeah, so we're just uh, 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 blindly calling it admin for now. Yeah. <laughs> they have they have uh, power over everything. And they just got an email notification that uh, rec who it's requested by, event participation, except this is the escalated request and it requires your approval. So now this third person, they can also click in to the application. And what they see, it looks very similar, but what they're actually looking at is the second approved uh, status, second approval by, second approval date. That's the only thing that's relevant to these, to this person. And so now this admin has the ability, you can see that the buttons are a little different, admin approval or admin deny and as an admin maybe i i say no nah, peter's been slacking off he's been going to conferences and hasn't been uh learning anything from them so i'm gonna go ahead and deny this we have a little confirmation bubble and because that second approval kind of overrides everything now we have uh a this is officially denied uh, uh, that that request and and you'll it'll kind of note that in the details of the app. So if we go back, well, and I just want to interject one yeah. thing you'll notice here that is that it doesn't show the approval by operations. Um, that was just by like our choice as we designed this application. If we wanted to show that, you could easily add that in and show those details. Any mm -hmm. additional details you wanted to show here, you could very easily add it in. We just decided that for whatever reason, admin doesn't need to see who approved. We did the first approval they just need to see the request yeah now we can look at so we're kind of just going through how the app works we're, we're gonna let's let's unpack this a little bit and look at how some of yeah, this was set up great. um to to tie kind of tie it full circle let's go back and pretend we're peter again and so this is peter's application and if i sync it i can see now um that i'd like to attend to, to a conference has been X'd out. Um, and you can see that that second approval uh, did not go through. So that is, that's roughly the scenario here. Now this can be kind of customized for any type of, everybody has unique levels of workflows, but the premise here, let's look at how these workflows are set up and just the big picture idea of, of how the it and also right before that we just look at the data really quickly to show what that looks like within google sheets yeah yeah definitely um again and the way to set this up sustainably is that manager data um is associated to every user it's so what the workflows are doing are they're saying like who requested this okay look at who their manager is and initiate the workflow to that manager that, that's how this is set up, and that's how these workflows are, are um, uh, arranged. They're not like hard-coded. It's not like if the user is Peter, then um, send it to uh, operations app. All right, so we're back in the editor. And if you go to the behavior tab, this is where you're gonna be able to control uh, what you see as like buttons appearing in your application, or what we call workflows which are triggered behaviors based on data changes. So for behind the scenes, um, emails and notifications and files that are being generated, reports being sent out. Um, and so let's start with the first one. This workflow is saying, look at the request table and every time a row has been added to that table, then do the following. Oops. 
and this is where you start customizing what the workflow is actually going to do and the, the best place to get started is to to build email workflows and that's really what we're focused on here is an email workflow that is sending that notification and giving someone a really quick way of jumping in viewing the request and approving it or denying it um, but the other options you have are you can send push notifications to mobile devices you can send text messages you can also create workflows that just change data behind the scenes so you could say that every time a request has been submitted um, go log it to this person's uh, uh, a record in a HR database um, you can also use webhooks you can also save files so if you wanted to just generate a PDF report or an HTML document or a JSON document or a CSV file um, there's a whole ton of functionality there uh, that you can create with workflows so in this case the focus is an email we're sending an email to the manager of the person who's making the request this is a, a concept of what, what we call dereference and so um, you can see in the data we have we're looking at the request table we're looking at the requested by column and the dereference here says look at that requested by value and then because this is a reference to the people table find the manager value for that person this is a really important concept um, that takes a little bit to get the hang of but this allows you to do things like uh, to find the value that's related to a certain record and then incorporate that into your app definition so in this case we're going to send that approval request to my manager and then you can define what are the contents of that email in this case it's a very simple email it's just saying new request from um, and you can customize things like the who's copied and what the reply to and the, the display um, you can put all the email body content just right here in this workflow you can also create a custom email template and what that's doing is it's actually using a Google Doc um, as a template you can see those these are just values from your data that you're incorporating into this template and that is the, um, just to jump back, that is how this email is generated. It's from that Google Doc template. Now this is a very simple one, but you can get very elaborate with this. You can build templates with tables in order to structure them and include images in it to attach PDF files. Um, you can get very elaborate with this. This is a good place to get started. I think it would be helpful to just explain a little more um, if you go back to this the um, requested by dot first name what that syntax how that syntax works yeah so again so this is another this is another example of a dereference and so what we're doing here is we're saying you know just a reminder this workflow is looking at the requests table so you always have to orient yourself around what data is this based off of what table is this view view based off of is this workflow based off of um, even actions so when you apply buttons what table is it being applied to in this case the request table what do we know here we know who requested um, this who who uh, the request is by who submitted it but in this table i don't know their first name i just know their email I don't know their manager um, you know uh, so for example here when I submitted this that was all the information I had but because I've set up a relationship between this table and the people table and this is that uh, that requested by as a reference what I can do is I can say okay look at this person this is their key this is a unique ID go find it in the people table and return the value of another column in this people table that is what a dereference is and so just like uh, I'm sending this email to my manager I can also go and find something like my first name and so in the workflow uh, first of all I'm sending the email to my manager 
but then the subject that my manager will get is uh, is actually just a new request from Peter. And so if I look at that email, you can see that the subject line uh, is just what that represents. Yeah, and I think it's helpful to note that in that dereference, um, the first, if you jump back to that tab, um, the requested oh, by, that is the column in the, in the um, first table. Yeah. And then first name is in the table you're referencing. Yes. So you always want to have that syntax, even if there's a reference between two columns and they're different, the columns have different names, you want to use the name of the column in the primary table of this action. The yeah. Workflow. Yeah, exactly. Um, all right. So just to, to step back a little bit, what we've created here is one email notification that's going to that initial manager. There are a few other um, workflows here. And you can see that they're very similar. Um, they're set up on the request table. So, so in this case, this first one goes out, the manager looks at it. If they approve it, then the original person who requested it will uh, need to get a notification that their request has been approved. Um, and so we've set up another workflow here, basically acknowledging that your request has been approved, and then here are the details of that. But this uh, approval notification is only going to go if uh, the request type um, is not, uh, does not require escalated approval. All right, so this is getting a little bit convoluted. For those of you that, that have been around a little bit longer, this is gonna make more sense. Uh, you can get into the granularity of this expression. What's important to know for, for newer users is that you can put granular conditions on when certain things show up in your apps or when certain behavior occurs. That is, that's the main point from this. Yeah. And so in this case, we just have some granular controls over, well, this will be approved right away if the, the, the request type doesn't require escalated approval. If it does require escalated approval, then another workflow is gonna trigger and this is what's going to send that email to the admin saying, we need a second level of approval. Uh, and then once that's approved, then you'll get your notification that your request is approved. Um, so um, you end up with sort of like a, a logical flow of, well, okay, if, if the criteria matches, then go ahead and move on to this step. If not, move on to the step after it. Um, this is a sort of thing, and, and I guess just also, I didn't uh, preface this, but uh, we'll make this application available. We'll post it in this office hours thread and anyone can look behind the scenes at how this is set up. You can copy it and use it however you like. Um, I think that's a good, uh, uh, we're not gonna get into all the details right now unless people have specific questions. So if you yeah. do post- So let's post actually uh, jump to some of the questions about this specific app um, within the forum. Cool. So uh, this question right here, Peter. Yeah. How did you have the thumbnail pictures, pictures show in requested by field along with the name? Yeah, with a validity of popular knowledge and Okay, so this is a this is a cool question, and it's not immediately obvious. Um, and this actually goes back to your uh, first question about or your comment about virtual columns. And Great. virtual columns and dereferences are the are the theme today. <laughs> um, all right, so the question is like this is a list of requests, and you can see that. You know, in the request table, we don't have any column for uh, thumbnail or for headshot of the user. And so what we've done here is, if you go into the data and columns, and you look in the columns of the requests, and you scroll down, what I've done is I've created a virtual column called requested by headshot. And the column type is an image, and the formula for this column is real, real simple, exactly what we were just talking about, which is look at the person who's made the request, dereference, then look at the, the people table and find the value of the headshot for that person. So that is, uh, what ends up happening then is, uh, if you go to people, okay, so we found Peter, we're gonna go over and find the headshot, 
And what we're using for headshots right now is this random uh, like Lego kind of stock imagery. Um, in this case, it's a, it's a link to that image, uh, but this also could be an uploaded file that's saved in your, uh, whatever your data source is. In this case, it'd be Google Drive. Um, so I think, let me know if that answers your question, but um, that's, that's a, nice, a nice trick to then so have, have a virtual a, column and a D reference there. Yes. And then the, the last piece of that is, so in, um, in a, we didn't talk about this a ton, but um, the key to the table, something that very often is automatically defined, we talked about what is the key or the unique ID, unique identifier um, for each table. That's something that you want to set in your columns. And so the request ID, that's going to be a key. If you look at the people, the email in our case, that's going to be the key. Um, but just because it's the key doesn't mean it needs to be that's what shows up. That's not, that doesn't need to be what represents that particular entry. And so the label is a way of distinguishing and saying, actually, you know, like I want to identify, I want to find people by their email, but I want to show their first name and their headshot uh, when I'm just viewing them the details of a person and so you can see here like this office supply request is requested by Chris and that's showing up as headshot and first name um, but it's identifying him by his email so that's that's what we've set right there so label is what shows up in the app and then key is how you're identifying them on kind of the back end let's say exactly yep. okay So we're spending a lot of time on this, and actually, we're I, we'll have to save this other application. Um, but uh, are there any other questions specifically about this app? Otherwise, let's spend some time jumping around, showing some other functionality. I think this one uh, by Romain applies. Is it possible to change the box text and button name when a button is on is clicked? Yeah, it is. Yeah, there is. And maybe we we'll look at the actions here for a second, um, and just how they're set up. Um, yeah, so a couple different ideas around uh, what we call buttons or actions. You'll see the term actions throughout your, your app, and um, that's generally how they're referred to. In this application, we have um, a few different actions. The main thing, the main functionality of those is just are you approving the request or are you denying it? And you can see um, if we go to behavior and actions, first thing you see is there are all sorts of actions in here, right? Um, I didn't make all of these. You'll see that a lot of these are what are known as system generated. And so these actions or buttons um, are created based on the data you've connected. And so a real easy, uh, real simple example of this is um, like if we go into, if we look at the people table, these actions were all generated by the system. Uh, and you can see you can delete people, you can edit them, you can add new people. All of this is specified. This appears because back when I added my tables, I actually allowed the ability to update, to add or delete um, records to that table. Now, if I had changed this and said, I actually just want people to be read only, and I go ahead and save it, then that influences the system generated actions. So all of a sudden that add and update and delete is removed. I can't do that anymore because I don't have permission to change uh, records in that table, but I still have a couple left over. And one is composing an email. So if I look in, into the detail of a person, because my email is showing up, then it says, actually, I'm going to give you a real quick way of uh, sending an email to this person. Um, and there's also an action for viewing the manager. And so in this case, because there's a relationship between me and my manager, um, it gives you a quick way of viewing the details moving to that record. So that's how these actions are set up. And so you'll see a ton of system generated ones. You can always go in and uh, Modify these if you'd like. You can remove them. You can say do not display. 
Um, I'd recommend creating uh, new ones, especially as you're getting familiar. If you add a new action, some of the uh, options that you'll have for creating an action, uh, first and foremost, you name it, you pick a table. So what table are we, is this record going to apply to? And then uh, you have a variety of options to choose from. The main categories of options are, are you going to interact with this app in some way? So are you gonna to go to another view? Are you going to copy data from the app? Are you going to uh, go to a form, for example? Um, modifying data, so that would be you know, like deleting or editing a row or adding another row to another table. And then uh, what we call external. So this is an example would be that email link. Whereas like if there's an email address, okay, click this and go initiate an email or start a text message or go to a website. Um, you also have the ability of grouping actions together. So if you have a variety of actions, you can, you can with one click, you can initiate a whole series of actions. Um, let's just look at the actions that we have set up here, which is to approve or deny. And so this, this particular action is designed to change the values of some columns in this row. And so very simply, it's saying every time you hit this action, which is the approve button, so it's a little checkbox, then set the value of approve to true, collect the username, the user email of the current user, and set the value for approved by, and then set the approved approval date to today. So a few things here. Right, these are using expressions in order to set the value. So every time, let's just look at this. When this action is hit, um, actually, let's go back to. And and as you're doing that, Peter, uh, yeah. I just want to call out John. This this helps answer your question too of how to use expressions within behavior. Uh, there's obviously various ways that you can use expressions. This is just one example within actions of how you can set some of these expressions um, for approvals. Yeah, yeah, these are these are simple expressions. Uh, we'll, let's, we'll, we can open this up and give you just a preview of, of uh, different options here. Yeah. But the main idea is, okay, so we have, uh, these are some requests that I have the ability to approve. So this is a vacation request. If I hit approve, so that little checkbox, you can see some things changed here. If I go into the detail, uh, you can see that, and actually let's just, uh, let's go back to one that's, that there are no details for you. All right, so office supplies, ton more post-it notes for the windows. Okay, let's find that one in the data. All right, so this is the current, this is the row. So this is a pending request and nobody has approved it yet. I'm logged in as this person's manager right now. And so when I hit the approve button, which is this action right here, you can see it kind of happening live. So the approved is marked as true. It's approved by uh, Mary, which is who I'm logged in as right now. And then the approval date is today. If I go back to that row, you can see this, these are the three fields that were just set by that action. So that first level of approval has been completed. Now to add a, uh, a kind of a finishing touch to this, you can see there's a green check, mark, check box. If I go back to UX and format rules, I have two different format rules set up for this app. And in this case, this is basically saying, um, this, is, this will actually be a good expression to look at, but this is essentially saying, if the request is approved, then apply a green check mark next to the details field. So you can see right here, there's the green check mark next to the details field uh, now that this request has been approved. Um, now, sorry, I know this is getting a little, a little long winded, but to, to keep the thought going here, that this is a this could be a simple format rule, you know, just is is it uh, is this approved or not? We have a little bit of a complex expression here, though, 
this is an example of, of how you can start using expressions to get more granular about conditions you're putting in your app. So this is very simply just when is a green check mark applied? Um, and what we're saying here is apply it if the request is approved and it doesn't require escalated approval. Or apply it if the escalated approval has been approved um, and it does require that escalated approval. So it's basically just uh, accounting for the fact that some of these requests are going to need to be approved by two people and only apply that green check mark if both of those people uh, have, have submitted their approval. Um, there's, I don't expect, uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of follow-up questions in regards to how this is set up, but I think it's more just trying to get you a taste of how to, to get things up and running, uh, where you can start getting granular with things and how you can set up a lot of this without very granular conditions um, as a place to get started. So we're, we're coming up towards the end of the hour. We spent a lot more time on this <laughs> first app yeah. than I expected, but I think there's a lot of good relevant questions to it. Um, there, there are a variety of, of questions here that I think we'd like to get into and spend at least the next uh, 10 or 15 minutes trying to address. Um, but for anyone that has to log off here at the end of the hour, thank you very much for joining. We went, we've kind of uh, uh, gone through a variety of different topics here, but we've really only covered uh, um, just kind of like one section of functionality in the editor. Um, if you are new to AppSheet, I definitely recommend joining us for future office hours. You'll get notifications as they come out, but generally it's every second Tuesday. Um, we also have some other webinars that are being ramped up uh, just for more introductions to AppSheet um, and also just the ability to go deeper into kind of more specific Q&A with the team. Um, so if you have to log off, thank you very much for joining. Uh, but if you have a few more minutes, let's hang around and we're going to uh, dive into more specific questions right now. So one question uh, from Ken, how do you populate the key field in the spreadsheet with unique values? So the uh, simple way of doing this, and this is those goes those goes back to the data. Um, to start, you know, for our people table, the expectation is here that if you're going to add a new person, uh, they're going to have a unique email address, and so that's an easy that's easy. Um, that may or may not be a safe assumption. You want to make sure that every uh, row. Uh, every data point does have a unique identifier. If there's a chance that you're going to have, you know, two listings with the same email in this case, then you're going to want to find a better ID. In this case, so we're we're just going to go ahead and uh, say it's safe to assume all these people have unique emails. For something like the requests, um, there's nothing about this that would necessarily be completely unique, um, and so we have to generate our own ID for every new request that comes in, and that's gonna be the key to this table. Um, it's best if IDs are text types, and if you scroll to the right in your columns, you can, you can see some of the settings for each column. One of those settings is the initial value. And in this case, initial value for an ID if you just use the expression unique ID and then open and close parentheses, that will, every time a new request is submitted, um, that will generate a new unique ID. So let's just look at that. Uh, and just, just for people new to AppSheet, if you ever want to see additional details, you can either scroll to the right or you can expand it. Yeah, so these columns, you can scroll to the right, um, or if you click right here, the little pencil icon, this opens up. Uh, what we call the column definition with all the granular settings for that particular column type. Um, so we've we've set the uh, initial value as a unique ID and let's just look at how that shows up. Now we've also though we've hidden this column 
So there's show, editable, and require. And so you can vary these. I would definitely experiment with toggling these on and off to just see how the it's affected in the app. If you go to my requests, I'll open up a new request. And you can see that the first column that shows up in this new form is request type and then details and then who it's requested by. And then the request date shows up, but it's not editable because the editable has been turned off. Uh, the requested by and the request date are automatically filled in because the initial value for this one is user email. So it's look, it's finding that user email, which is operations at Brickland Holding, but the headshot and the first name are what are going to show up because that's the label. And then the request date is today. So if we go turn this unique ID on, make that visible, now all of a sudden you see that is the first field. And so that it's just generating a unique ID uh, and filling it out for this entry. Um, but because most of the time you're not going to want to customize this, um, you can. it's generally best to just go ahead and hide it and it will fill that initial value in behind the scenes. So just to recap, if you could summarize what a show editable and uh, um, required mean. Yeah. So um, whether you're adding new data to your app or you're just looking at an existing entry, these show and editable and required conditions are going to affect how things show up uh, if users can edit the data um, and if they are editing it, if they have to include a value for that field. Uh, and that this is this is this will this will affect forms. It'll affect anywhere that the data is visible throughout your application. So you have to kind of take that into account. Now, one way that we've taken it into account for this particular workflow approval app is when you go down and you see, okay, we've got you know the two layers of approval. These two layers of approval have pretty specific show if and editable if conditions applied to them so that only uh, they only show up if the person using the application is the manager of the person who's made the request. Um, so this gets pretty granular with like how, how then that exposes some of the fields to different user types. Um, but it's, this is really important at least to be thinking about as you're thinking about what is the functionality I want to build into my application and how do I make it most relevant to the end user so that every user just doesn't see every field. Um, you want things to be really efficient and to only expose just what's relevant to that end user at that given time. Yep, and, and this is a good reminder that if you, when you're setting the show editable and required criteria, if you want something more complex than just on or off, you can always click on that little flask to the right and edit and throw in whatever expression you want for what that criteria should be. If you're um, if you're new if you're brand new to AppSheet, um, some of these fields may not show up for you immediately. Um, throughout the application, you may see show standard view or show expanded view. If you toggle that, then uh, you'll see some more options just to get more granular, more fine-tuned control over all of these settings. All right. Um, do you want to scan the office hours thread? And I think let's there's... see. So Kathy said because um, yes, Kathy, that looks right. That's how it works. Uh, just had a follow-up question about dereferences. That does look right. Okay. Um, copy. Oh, this is a mark. Um, unfortunately, there is not. An action. So the question from Mark is: uh, Is there any way to just copy the data from your application to literally like Control C, copy, and then uh, so that you can paste it somewhere else? Uh, for example, in an email you're generating. Mm. Um, <clears throat> I think the short answer is no, um, and that'll that'll have to be done just you know using your mouse if you're using the app as a web app or just you know by highlighting on your mobile device. You should be able to highlight believe yeah depending on what uh, device you have or what OS um, I guess just on this on this topic though 
the intent is to copy a string, some information from your application, and then paste it into an email or a document. Um, the short answer is there, there may not be that many options just offhand, um, but I think it is good to think about also, if you're trying to generate emails based on data in your application, um, there are also, it's, this may not be exactly what you're asking for, Mark, but there are lots of ways you can think about um, initiating an action and then pre-filling that action with a certain value of a field. Um, so you may want to send a text message, for example, that has value uh, from uh, has some some uh, value or record from the application to send to someone. Um, there's some flexibility there for what you can do. So definitely, yeah, play around with the actions and the workflows within the behavior tab, um, and you'll should be able to, uh, you know, send emails and documents or have emails and documents generate based off of. Um, text in your app. Uh, the other thing I'd say is that if this is something that a lot of people are seeing, like oh, I really want to be able to copy paste and this is functionality, um, we always tell people to go to the feature requests um, page within the community and um, put in your feature requests or try to find a feature request that already mentions that, vote for it. Um, our, engin our engineering team scans through that very often to decide what the roadmap is and what they're going to work on. Um, so when there's things that have a lot of votes and a lot of requests, that's a that's something we look at. So please go there if that's um, something really important. I'd like to, um, so I guess just to cap off this application, and there's some more questions here that we can get to, but in this case, um, you know, if you are new and you have not created an application yet, um, this application, so I built, I built this in about an hour last night in preparation for, and so, you know, some of this, uh, the actual build time was about an hour, but I probably spent a, a good hour before that just trying to think about, okay, well, what do I want the application to do? And what am I gonna need in my data structure in order to accomplish that? So things like, there's gonna be a manager, I'm gonna need a manager information for every person. I'm gonna need to be able to escalate to an admin. Um, I'm gonna need these types of details in the request in order to initiate a workflow. Um, so I guess just keep that in mind as you're planning. But once you have, so once I have this functioning, um, I'm gonna want to get this in the hands of users as quickly as possible. Um, because as you can tell, you know, I'm, I'm pretending to be a few different types of users right now. And you can do it and you can preview your application as different users, um, but it's good to get the app in the hands of people that are going to be using it. So you can, if you can think about who that initial group will be, you can send individual in, uh, invites, or you can just say, well, I know everybody at appsheet.com is allowed to have access to this. And so I'm gonna go ahead and grant appsheet.com access, and then I'll go ahead and share either the web app, the browser link, or the mobile installation link. Uh, maybe via email or uh, some chat method. Um, these are really easy ways of just getting in the hands of your users uh, to start testing and providing feedback to you right away. So in the application, you can just share feedback directly with the app creator. Um, I just recommend generally the people that start that uh, sooner than later uh, have more success and are able to modify and update their application and get it to a, a real effective place. And when you are thinking through what you want your app to do beforehand, what personally, what does that look like for you? Are you writing down like, oh, these are the requirements or are you just kind of thinking that's, in your head or, or what, what does that look like? Sometimes, I guess it depends on the, how elaborate functionality the application is going to be. Mm -hmm. I think very frequently I brainstorm by just creating columns in my data source. And so sometimes I'll, most of the time I'll start with a Google Sheet. And if I'm going to move to a database eventually, like that's easy to transition to later once I have my application up and running. Yeah. Um, I personally try to, I like to lay things out um, in, in my spreadsheet as columns. Because then that also, the next step is I like to start with a little bit of sample data um, to get my app started with. Um, and so then I'll just move stuff around there. And, and I think for, this is a relatively straightforward, this, this app, 
kind of has singular purpose. Um, if the app is going to include many different types of functions, for example, if I'm building like a, a small CRM, then I might do a little bit more mapping out and kind of documenting an outline of everything I want to include. Um, I don't know what. Uh, how, do, how do you feel? I, I, I actually really like the uh, you know suggestion you have of hey, let's put a little bit of sample data in. Uh, that works for me too. And one of the reasons is because when you uh, you know if you use the uh, just like for example like Google Sheet add-on or something to say hey, turn this into an application, then um, actually we'll actually read through that sample data and make some inferences based off of what that data is and say oh hey this type looks like it's an email this type looks like it's a uh, lat long things like that um so it can kind of do that first step for you uh so not only is it a great way to plan things out ahead of time but it's it's really helpful as well uh, and i do a combination too of let's fill out some columns and if there's workflow requirements i'll usually just write them out to make sure that i can you know check off those boxes as i go through it um, and as I'm building it out, I'll usually jump between like data and views and things like that. Um, maybe uh, just because I'm not as, you know, not as professional as Peter is at making apps, but uh, <laughs> I do a lot of jumping around for sure. I, um, and, uh, you know, trying to make sure that I'm getting each of those requirements built out. And then that's actually, I, I really like that point. And I've said this in the past and I do the exact same thing, which is, I think it, so if if you're newer and you're still hanging around, thanks for hanging overtime. This is office hours overtime. That's what we should call it. <laughs> anytime we go over 10 a.m. Um, the I it it's good to expect you're gonna spend um, a lot of time in the data section and defining that data and how it's set up. And as you move into the UX section and start building views of your application, you're gonna realize, oh, actually, I don't want this field to show up in this particular instance. So I'm gonna to have to go back and add some criteria to my data. And there's a lot of what Chris is describing, which is like back and forth. Oh, okay, no, I, now I want this functionality in my app, but I'm, I'm gonna to need to account for it in my data. I wanna add a signature column. Okay, well then that means going back to the data source, add a signature column, regenerate the table, and then go into my view and, and kind of and specify how to expose that, that new column yep. in my app. Um, so it's, uh, I would definitely expect that back and forth, Good to know. whether or not you're pro. <laughs> <laughs> um, I There are a few more questions here. I, I wanted to end on just um, a preview of one other application. And this is the one that we didn't get to. This is the agenda item number two. We're not going to go into a ton of detail, but I just wanted to preview it as a way of thinking about other possible use cases. Um, because this first app that we focused on, the the interface was not very interesting, right? It was basically just two lists of requests, um, two different types of requests. I wanted to just preview this for a second, and then I think we'll we'll start wrapping things up. So if anyone else has any other questions, please add them in here, and we'll we'll follow up afterward. But well, let's end on just a preview of another app here. This one is. Uh, relatively simple, it's called Host Helper. So the idea here is if you have a hotel or an Airbnb, um, or just any type of, uh, I guess, you know, facility, if you have an office, you can use it similarly. The idea is, all right, we have a, a, a bed and breakfast located out here. Uh, this is Seattle Discovery Park. And when we open it up, this bed and breakfast has a variety of rooms that are contained within it. And if we look at one of these rooms, you can see that the room has, um, we've got what it's called like an XY map or an internal map. And this map, it could be a floor plan, just like a top-down floor plan. In this case, we actually just have a picture of the room and we've applied uh, icons to it. And then these icons, when you look at the details, they have actions that allow you to check whether or not uh, a step in this process has been accomplished. So in this case, uh, we have to lock the door. Check. Okay, now it's green. All right, I have to go through and uh, I have to fill this little thing up with water. All right, check. Uh, I need to adjust the TV. Check. And you can see, you can kind of go around the room and progress uh, through the to-do list. And behind the scenes, that is um, 
all it's doing is changing the status of these different checkpoints. This is very, very simple. And it's using those actions to change the value of that table. And what happens then is we have this set up so that the, with format rules, so that after 24 hours or uh, the next day, the assumption is that these things have to be done daily. And so uh, the next day, all these things will turn red again and you have to go through the same process. So you can have a, just a complete look of, okay, what, you know, have all the tasks been done for today? Um, this uses, this app has more interesting view types in here. And so it uses just a general map, first of all, to plot the location of this building. And the reason we are able to do that, the building has an address. And then if we look at the rooms within that building, you can see we have a list of rooms are related. And each of these rooms have an image um, that's being used as an internal map. So if we look at the rooms, you can see the rooms are associated to the building and each room has an image. Uh, and that's what we're plotting those X, Y points on. That's a whole other topic of how to get that set up. But I just wanted to show this as like a completely different uh, version of an application. It does not rely on workflows. You could very easily incorporate workflows into this, but for now, this application is just kind of oriented around this uh, checklist of, of to-do items. Um, we just wanted to end on something a little bit more diverse. Short answer is all sorts of scenarios. Um, some are more for mobile app, uh, some are more for web app. And some um, are great for both. Some are great for both. And we'll we'll dive into a lot more examples of this in future office hours. And so if this is interesting, if this has been helpful, uh, I appreciate you joining for more than an hour. Um, and we will all, we'll, we'll, we incorporate other people on the team into these office hours. We'll bring in engineers when new features are launched. Uh, and we'll, we'll pose new scenarios like this uh, for different types of applications, different types of scenarios. So it's always great to get your feedback in the office hours thread for questions you have or just interesting scenarios that you'd like to see addressed. Um, that really helps dictate um, future agendas. And we're going to be trying to pick up the pace and the regularity of which we do these just because of, uh, you know, we have a lot of, of um, newer people that are joining the past couple months with the announcement of the Google acquisition. And we want to make sure everybody's got a good solid place to start for how to get building apps. Um, with that, Chris, was there anything else that you're open to add in here? Yeah, I think that's great. All right, thanks a, thanks a lot for hanging around. This has been um, a little free form, but I hope it was useful. Please let us know, um, and, uh, and we will send out notifications for the next office hours for you to join. Uh, and for those questions that we weren't able to get to, we'll try to follow up. Uh, individually, but we'll we'll try to post uh, answers in this office hours thread in the community um, as much as possible. And where will we put the uh, app we went over today? Ah, uh, yeah. So the, a recording of this webinar, as well as uh, uh, these sample apps that you can look at, you can copy, you can uh, look behind, like under the hood uh, in the app editor. Um, those we'll we'll post all of this in this office hours thread. So if you're interested in um, digging in. Uh, look for it here in the community. Cool. Thanks, Chris. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day, everyone. Hi, this is Chris.